Hello and welcome to Learn A-Level Biology for Free with Miss Estrick. In this video, we're going to be going through what a vaccination is, herd immunity, active and passive immunity as well. If you are new here, then click the subscribe button to keep up to date on all the latest biology and revision tips videos. And if you do find this helpful today, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to make notes as you go through, grab a pen and paper now and pause as and when. So first of all, passive immunity. This is when you don't actually create the antibodies yourself. So you would have had the antibodies introduced into you and that might be through an injection of pure antibodies. So what this means is that antibodies will be very, very fast working, but you won't have any memory cells because you didn't naturally create those antibodies. So you won't have any long-term immunity. So examples of this could be um, when antibodies are passed through the placenta to a fetus from the mother or through breast milk to a baby as well. Also snake venom. So you need a very, very quick response um, to neutralize that snake venom. You also have um, passive immunity when you're injecting in the antibodies um, to the toxins. So in contrast, active immunity is when you have created the antibodies yourself. So your immune system has created the antibodies. And that's only going to be the case if you have been exposed to the pathogen or the antigen. And this can be subdivided into two types of active immunity. First one is natural active. And this is if you've been infected with the pathogen. So you've been naturally infected and you've created antibodies and memory cells. Artificial active immunity is what we're going to be focusing on in this video. So this is what vaccines are. So you don't actually have a natural exposure to the pathogen or antibody. It's artificial. So it's probably going to have been an injection. So a vaccine isn't necessarily an injection, even though that's the phrase that you tend to hear in everyday language, because it's the most common type of vaccine. But what a vaccine actually is, is a weak or weakened or dead form of the pathogen, or it could be the pathogen's antigens, but it can actually be introduced as a liquid in the mouth or via injection. And what that does then is when your um, lymphocytes are exposed to the antigen, it's going to activate the B cells to go through clonal expansion and differentiation. So clonal selection, which was mentioned in the humoral video. So if you do want to just click here and have a recap on that, then the link is here. So once clonal selection has occurred, you'll then have plasma cells and memory B cells. The plasma cells will make antibodies for that pathogen. But what's important for a vaccine is the memory B cells which are created. And those memory B cells will then remain in your blood for potentially decades. So if you are then reinfected with the pathogen, you're able to create the plasma cells, which can make the correct antibody very, very rapidly and in large quantities. And then those plasma cells will make lots of antibodies very, very quickly. So that's what we're seeing here. The memory B cell stays in your blood for decades. And as I said, if you are exposed to the pathogen that you've been vaccinated for, then your memory B cells will divide by mitosis and that will make lots and lots of plasma cells rapidly. And this is our secondary response. The first response or primary response was when you're exposed to the pathogen via the vaccine. Secondary response would be when you're exposed to it um, naturally. So you've actually contracted it and you're infected. But you have such a rapid um, production of these plasma cells. You create large quantities of the antibody so quickly that you don't actually get the symptoms. So those antibodies are able to agglutinate and stick together the pathogen and then it'll get destroyed before it can cause symptoms. And that's what we call the active immunity. So this graph is demonstrating that primary versus secondary response. And this would happen with natural active immunity, but also with your artificial active immunity, which is the example of vaccines. So this primary response will be when your initial exposure was the small volume 
of weakened or dead pathogens or it could be the antigen and you will create um, some antibodies as well as the key thing is the memory b cells but the secondary exposure in this case would be if you are infected with that pathogen which you had the vaccine for and because you create the antibodies very very rapidly so it's a short space of time and in such large quantities you wouldn't get the symptoms of the disease and that's what we mean when we say you are immune so you can still get the pathogen inside of your body you can still get infected but your body is able to destroy the pathogen before it can cause any symptoms and therefore cause the disease so next then is this concept of herd immunity and what this means is if a large enough number of the population get vaccinated against a particular disease that will then mean that the pathogen can't easily spread amongst the people who aren't vaccinated and the reality is it's near impossible to get every single person in a large population vaccinated for different reasons some reasons are um, if you're very very young so if you're a child or a baby it's not recommended that you have certain vaccines because your immune system isn't developed enough to be able to cope with the vaccine some people who might have illnesses already or compromised immune systems from autoimmune diseases or other drugs they might be on also are unable to have the vaccine so that's the why this idea of herd immunity is so important to protect those who are too vulnerable to be able to have the vaccine and that's what this is showing us here if there wasn't herd immunity so you didn't have a large enough proportion of the population already immune when this first person does contract whatever disease it might be then they're able to pass it on to the people who aren't already immunized and that then means those two are able to pass it on to those who aren't immunized and it's easier for that pathogen to spread whereas if you have herd immunity in this example we can see that most of the people are already immunized so they've had the vaccine we've got one person here who isn't so they might contract it but then if again if you've got enough people who are vaccinated you might pass on to only one but it's not going to spread very far and overall it should protect most of the population now one thing to bear in mind is this idea of antigen variability and this did come up in the video on antigens and cell recognition which i'll just link here if you haven't seen it but this just explains why certain vaccines do have to be updated and it's because pathogens their dna can mutate frequently and it does mutate frequently and if it happens to be a mutation in the gene which codes for the shape of the antigen and the antigen shape changes that means the memory b cells that you have will no longer be effective because those memory b cells will be storing the antibody for the old antigen shape and not the new one so that's why for the flu the influenza flu virus we do create new vaccines every year because that is just how rapidly the influenza virus mutates so antigen variability can compromise how effective um, vaccines can be long term so that's it for vaccines the key things you need to know are that vaccines do provide protection for individuals and the population against disease herd immunity is this concept that if enough of the population are vaccinated it'll protect those who aren't passive immunity is when the antibodies are introduced into your body whereas in contrast active immunity is when you've created them yourself and therefore you have memory cells as well so if you have found today's video helpful please give it a thumbs up and click the subscribe button head over to missestrick.com for any practice questions on this topic and my instagram account missestrick i post daily questions as well on the instagram stories